Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. You know, with social media nowadays, you see all the crazy video of storm chasers getting close to storms and tornadoes. Well, this week we're talking about a group of scientists that get close to storms in order to uh, get scientific observations, which are helping a lot of research when it comes to storms and tornadoes. Today, we're talking with Dr. Josh Werman from uh, the University of Illinois. He is executive director of the farm facility. So, Dr. Werman, I, I love all the acronyms that we can come up with in science. So, what is FARM? It's the flexible array of radars and mesonets. And that also lets us choose names for our new radars and things which sound like farm animals. So our newest radar is called the C-Band on Wheels, a cow. And uh, we want to build a, a bigger radar that's going to be an S-Band on Wheels, a sow. Uh, so we're doing different types of animal names for our radars now. <laughs> I love all the names. So why is it important when you're trying to get the data to have you know, mobile and quickly deploying style instruments like that. We're trying to understand what's happening inside tornadoes, what's happening near the ground. We're trying to see the fine scale details. So there's really no better way to do that than to get instruments close up to the tornadoes and in fact, sometimes even inside the tornadoes. So if we can get our radars on trucks, the Doppler and wheels, if we can get them close up to a tornado, say a mile away, then we can get data that is literally thousands of times better than you get much farther away. Um, sometimes I'll tell students that it's a difference between taking a picture across a parking lot and of your hand and looking close up at your hand. You can see your fingerprints when you're close up. From across the parking lot, no way. Maybe you can count the fingers. But if you want to see the fingerprints of the tornado, of how it's forming, of how it's doing damage, you need to be super close up. So that's why we're chasing them, but chasing them with a scientific purpose. So a lot of chasers, you know, are trying to move around and position right. For you having a big group of uh, vehicles and instruments and trying to place them and very expensive, I'm sure, and stuff you don't want to damage, what all goes into work of trying to strategically plan where you need to be and moving everything around? Well, there are thousands of, of chasers and what 99% of chasers do is recreational. They're out there looking to get interesting imagery, videos, imagery, pictures of themselves with that imagery um, in, in and near the tornadoes. And that's great. Um, and so we are out there on the same roads uh, with people who are doing this recreationally. But what we're doing is a very complex choreography. We're trying to get our multiple radars and other instruments in very precise positions so that we can measure specific things about those tornadoes. We don't just want a picture, we want radar data from different angles, from different ranges at different levels in the storm. Similarly, we want cross sections through that storm with the instruments we deploy and hope get hit by the tornado um, right in front of them, combining that with the radar data. Uh, so while we're out sharing the same roads with people who are doing the project uh, recreationally, um, we have a, a very different purpose. So you all are getting amazing data, and this year you went on a storm that uh, got a lot of national attention, the uh, Greensfield, or Greenfield, Iowa tornado. Uh, tell us about the 300 plus mile per hour winds y'all picked up in that storm. Sure, so it was, uh, we got our radars and, and other instruments um, right up close to the Greenfield tornado. Uh, we deployed very close to this town as the tornado was passing through the town. Um, and caused a lot of destruction there. Um, it was fortunately very, very small, but it was extremely intense. We measured winds over 300 miles an hour, um, and that's among the highest winds we've ever measured. Um, we actually have the, all the wind speed records because we're the ones who are measuring up close with the radars. That level of wind can pretty much destroy anything in its narrow path. Um, this particular tornado only got rated EF4, most likely because there just weren't stronger objects in its path that it could destroy. Um, you have to remember tornado ratings are based on the damage that occurs. So a tornado with 300 mile an hour winds passing through an open field might get rated very low, might even be EF0, EF1, EF2. When it passes through a town, those ratings go up because they potentially can damage more things. If it passes through a well-engineered structure, commercial structures, things like that, um, then sometimes they can earn those EF5 ratings. It's a combination of the wind speeds and what they happen to damage that results in an EF official rating of that sort. What we measure with the Doppler and wheels are 
the actual winds or actually the debris spinning around in the tornado, which we assume is moving kind of with the wind, um, actually moves a little slower than the wind. Um, but we can map out the winds over every house, over every structure, and we're going to be combining that with damage survey information to try to learn more about how those winds were changing as it went through the town um, and how those winds did damage, uh, what levels of winds caused um, what levels of damage. One interesting thing about Greenfield is the tornado was dying as it was going through Greenfield. It was getting smaller, it was contracting to be very, very narrow tornado and died shortly northeast of the town as another tornado formed just to its east, in fact, just about over us. Um, but during that death process, it was intensifying. It was contracting and intensifying. So some of the worst winds were as the tornado was near death. Wow, that, that, that's very interesting. And, and you were talking about the advantage of being close compared to just a stationary radar. With that storm moving, say, 45 miles per hour or so and being small, that's something if you didn't have the radar there, we probably wouldn't have any clue of how fast those winds were other than the damage assessment, right? In particular case of Greenfield, we would know that there were very strong winds because it caused EF4 levels of damage as it passed through the town. Of course, we mapped out the winds before it went through the town at other times, and we have a whole history of what those winds are um, as it went through a whole lot of uh, wind turbines, as it went through open fields, um, it damaged and destroyed some farmhouses and farm structures. And we can map out those winds during its entire history. With just damage surveys, you're primarily mapping out the intensity of the winds when it's in towns. There are many tornadoes which go mostly through open areas um, or spend most of their lives or their strongest part of their lives um, in open areas. And we've shown statistically that they are uh, underrated by, by damage surveys alone. So all of this data, how, how much is this helping with it, whether modeling or trying to learn how tornadoes form? Uh, is your data helping out with this? When we go out with our radars and other instruments, we're focusing on two different goals. One is what we're talking about mostly with Greenfield. The other focus we have is how do the tornadoes form? Why do most mean looking threatening thunderstorms with rotations not make tornadoes? I mean, the false alarm rate for tornado warnings is huge because most of these threatening storms don't make tornadoes. Well, why? How can we make those predictions more precise so that we can reduce the number of warnings but maintain the, the accuracy, not miss any? Um, and the second question, once we can start to answer that first question, there's a whole second set of questions we want to answer, which is why do some tornadoes get so strong? Why do some tornadoes get large while others are small? Um, some tornadoes, as they die, just kind of dissipate and wither out. The Greenfield tornado did something entirely different and very dangerous. Um, are there ways to look at the environment that's around the tornado, look at how you know, the existing conditions in the tornado and make better understanding and make better predictions about why that happened and, and whether that's gonna happen in a future tornado? Right now, tornado warnings come in basically one flavor. There's a tornado warning. Um, and whether it's a weak tornado or a strong tornado, big or small, it's all pretty much the same warning. Go seek shelter. Um, other kinds of storms, when it's a snowstorm or a hurricane or a severe thunderstorm, there's much more nuance. When a hurricane's coming to the coast, you're told, hey, that's a Cat 5. Everybody within five miles of the coast should evacuate. Or, hey, it's a cat one. Maybe we just need to evacuate the barrier islands. You're told something. You're told something about what regions need to evacuate. With tornadoes, again, it's just one flavor. Uh, what I would like to see, and this might be 10 or 20 years away, is more nuance in tornado warning. So the public is given some advice about whether it's likely to be a very weak tornado or likely to be a very strong tornado, whether it's long lived or short lived. Uh, more information so that the public can either seek shelter in their home for maybe the weaker or moderate tornadoes, or perhaps for a very, very strong tornado where we have a chance that your house might not survive, maybe you should take that extra chance and get to a stronger community shelter, just like we have nuance in hurricane evacuation. Well, as somebody on TV that has to communicate that stuff, that would be amazing on my end if we had a more clarity with that for sure. But. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, think about the last time you talk about a snowstorm. I mean, you tell people whether there's going to be one inch or one foot, 
and people take different actions. Um, and that one could imagine a future where people do take different actions. They're not just one action, go to the quickest basement um, for a tornado. One of the things y'all do with your uh, farm and the Dow and cow and all these fun uh, is educating students and getting them out in the field to see. H how much do you enjoy that part of the science and being able to be out there to educate more uh, potential future meteorologists and what's going on in the environment? Seeing the next generation, generations of young people um, interested in weather, interested in severe weather, interested in non-severe weather, um, and getting observations of the world around them and nature, uh, I, I love it. I think it's great that they're interested. Um, the Doppler on wheels and the weather we study, not just with tornadoes, but we go into hurricanes and blizzards and rainstorms. We study all kinds of weather, in fact, all the way around the world. Um, it's, it's great that students are, get interested in this. What we try to do is show the exciting parts of science. I mean, there's a lot of hard work and sitting there on the computer or writing things down and equations, but there's also a lot of excitement in discovering new things and seeing things that haven't been seen before or understanding something that's never been understood before. And that age of discovery is still ongoing with, with vigor in, in science. There's a lot we don't know about tornadoes. There's a lot we don't know about hurricanes. There's a lot we don't know about a lot of other very important high impact weather. We've just been getting into looking at fires. Out in the West, there are fires every year and increasingly with these dry, hot summers that we've been having recently. And what's going on inside? Um, how do we predict which direction they're gonna go so firefighters can be more effective and also at less risk? Because these firefighters die fighting fires sometimes because the wind shifts unpredictably and, and the fire heads their direction. So we've been taking Doppler and wheels up close to the fires, mapping out this plume, which sort of looks like a tornado, and seeing what's inside, seeing where the hot spots are. So there's a lot of new areas that we're getting into which are very exciting and which I hope and I, I think it will happen that young people um, get engaged in so we keep learning more, more and more about the environment we live in and how to live with nature, um, how to be safer from fires, safer from hurricanes, safer from tornadoes.